Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Gary Schmidt, who is a children's book author, and he is actually a Newbery Award winner for his book um, on, uh, it's called The uh, Wednesday Wars, and uh, um, I'm going to let you tell people about what it is exactly that you write. Exactly, exactly. Well, um, <laughs> I write, in general, I write middle grade novels. Um, and my interest is in realism. So I'm not the guy that tends towards fantasy too much. But I like to write, uh, write about kids who are in those middle grades, mostly because there's so much interesting tension. I mean, so many of us can look back and we'd say, boy, wouldn't it be fun to live in college years again or to relive my high school years? No one says, oh my, I wish I could relive middle school. No one ever says that. And I think there's some good reasons for that. Um, it's where you are, you know, on some days you're a kid and some days you're an adult and you are moving back and forth, trying to negotiate both of those. So if you're writing middle, middle grade, you're sort of starting right away with some interesting tension. And that's what I really like to do and to explore. I've done a few picture books. Um, those are fun and wicked hard. Um, just because the scope is so, so small. And I've done some nonfiction as well. But I think in general, my my biggest area, I suppose, or the area that I'm most comfortable in is middle grade novel. Okay. And what can readers expect from your latest book? Uh, the latest one is called The Labors of Hercules Beale. I had to make sure that the Beale was on the end of that title, so because it, it isn't about the labors of Hercules, you know, the great, the great myth. Uh, and it's a story set on Cape Cod, in Truro, uh, where I can remember going as a teenager um, and spending time on the shore there, and standing on this one particular dune where you can look across and see Cape Cod Bay on the one side and the Atlantic on the other. And it was just really spectacular. So in that book, there's a young boy, um, Hercules, who is very small and who does not physically live up to his name. And the book starts about a year or so after his parents have been killed in a car accident. And his older brother has come back from his job to take care of him. And it's um, a kid who's sort of dealing with a little bit of guilt about that and loss. And he meets a teacher. And if you know the book Wednesday Wars, it's Danny, who's a kid in that, in that book. Uh, who is a Marine, a post um, retired Marine. And this teacher recognizes what he's going through, his loss. <clears throat> and so he assigns him a year long task. And the year long task is to reenact all the 12 labors of Hercules, um, but on Cape Cod, in contemporary Cape Cod. So like finding the Nemean lion and bringing it back, um, defeating the Hydra, um, all the sort of things that Hercules the myth has to do he has to find a way to reenact that. Um, and it's a way for him to kind of begin to deal with the loss that he's had. So it's a book that's, I hope, I hope funny. Um, funny is hard. And I hope moving and I hope surprising um, until he comes to the end and discovers essentially exactly what the mythical Hercules had discovered. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Wow. That sounds very, very interesting. Um, was, so was, what, what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Oh, I think a lot of, particularly for middle grade, at least if my experience um, as a reader in middle grade is, is the same, um, you see characters who are very similar to you um, or who may be aspirationally um, important for you, that you would like to be like that character or characters who are facing issues that you too face. Um, Middle school is a, the hard time there is that you're negotiating a very wide social circle of many different kinds of people where you're trying to deal with parents and new relationships with those because you're growing up and you're not just a kid anymore. Um, elderly folks in your life, grandparents, who may you may recognize may not be there forever and it's something you don't even think about as a child, but suddenly you do realize that. Uh, the community that's in school with that large range, um, people that you're attracted to, good friends, old friends that you may have lost, jerks, because school is always full of jerks, right? 
teachers who know what they're doing and teachers who don't. Um, people who care for you and people who don't particularly. Uh, all of those things are coming about and to see them in not only in real life, but to see them working themselves out in a novel is in some ways attractive, interesting, but also encouraging that you recognize that everything that I'm going through isn't unique, though it feels unique, but it isn't. It's everything that I'm going through, I also see it elsewhere in this book. And that can be encouraging and hopeful, I suppose. Uh -huh. Okay. So what was the actual inspiration that you had for um, the labors of Hercules Beale? Um, that dune has never left me. I think I first saw it when I was 14. So it's a long time ago. Um, and I remember we were driving up to Provincetown and we climbed up this dune and so there was something just astonishing about it that you could see two bodies of water just looking from side to side was really, really a big deal. And then if you put that together with years later, I'm teaching um, Henry David Thoreau, Cape Cod, which is a book that he wrote before he died, obviously, but wasn't published until after he died. So it's kind of a mess of a book. Um, but in that, he talks about standing on Cape Cod and looking out to the Atlantic. And he says, a man can put his, put all America behind him, or something like on Cape Cod, a man can put all America behind him, which is literally true. I mean, you literally can stand on that dune and look out to the Atlantic and all of America is now behind you. And I, that quote has, has, again, just really resonated with me, I think, that whole idea. And then maybe the third thing that was big for me in that um, was thinking of my father, um, who died a while ago, and he was a banker. He liked his job. He would drive into Flushing, New York, 90 minutes each way. That's what the traffic was like. Um, but what he really, really wanted in his life was to have a nursery, you know, a garden, to be a gardener and to um, run a nursery. And he was just a little afraid of making that leap. So he stayed with a job that was okay, that he liked, um, that made good money, that was safe, that had you know a pension at the end of it, but never made the leap to getting the business that he really, really wanted. And in a way, this is sort of me giving him the business he really, really wanted. Um, so this, this uh, uh, Hercules and his older brother Achilles, nice names, right? Um, live in the, or work in this nursery. And it's sort of the nursery that I imagined he would have liked. So all those things come together, right? And who knows why at one point you start and then you write down your first sentence and there they all are and they start to just merge well together. Um, I don't know. I think it's, I wish I could say here's is the logical, rational reason why this book started on this way. But books are so organic that way. And um, sometimes they start and stop Sometimes you get the idea and you wait a long time. Sometimes you get an idea and it goes gangbusters and then it's dumb, it's stupid. And you just get rid of it. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, I started a book once, to a retelling of, of The Wizard of Oz, and I told it from the point of view of Toto, which sounded <laughs> so smart, right? I mean, it sounds like so engaging. So let's have the dog tell the story. But, you know, after a little while, you realize, wow, that was just a dumb idea. It was just a bad idea. I mean, he's in a basket at the beginning. He doesn't even see anything. So, yeah. So that all went by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very interesting what you were talking about there. Um, that, are you a outliner or a pantser? I mean, do you outline your, your stories yeah. or do you? Oh my, no, definitely a pantser. Absolutely. It's, um, and I think that there are big advantages to that, actually. I know it sounds counterproductive to say that there are advantages. Um, and I know that there are people, I mean, Donna Jo Napoli, for example, who, um, who write, who outlines very, very strongly and then writes very, very quickly with long revision afterwards. Um, and she can write a novel in just you know, six weeks and you just go, oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. Um, but that's not me. I really just start, I want to hear the voice. 
the, the person who's telling the story. I want to hear that voice. I want to know what the, what the beginning situation is. Um, so for me, I know that Achille, uh, uh, Hercules in this book lost his parents, um, living with his brother. He's not happy with that. He's going to have to go to a new school, middle school. Um, so that's the sort of uneasy situation. And I could hear the voice that would work for that book. Um, and that's it. And then after that, I just go 500 words a day, see what happens. 500 words today, a, a day, and you know, who knows what happens. I have no idea what happens tomorrow. So this morning, I'm writing about this little town in Western Massachusetts, not far from Worcester, actually. Um, it's a made up town, but in my head, I know exactly where it is. And I did my two pages. And I ended at this place where this kid walks into a bookshop, actually. And now I have no idea what happens tomorrow. But it'll come. You know, it'll come to me. And I'll figure it out. And if it stinks, then I just cross it off and, you know, do it again. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't outline. You can't believe how often I go to a school and some student there will say, could you tell us, do you outline everything you do? And in that moment that follows that question, you look and see every kid in the whole school is thinking, please say no, please say no, please say no. And every teacher is saying, please say yes, please say yes, please say yes. And, and eventually I had to be honest and say, no, I really don't. And then you can't believe how often kids start to cheer. But so it must be a disappointment to a whole group of people, but not to them. <laughs> I can understand why. <laughs> oh, wow. So, I mean, since since your book, um, this, since this book is about Hercules, I mean, basically it follows the the uh, the labors of Hercules. Um, you must have had to do a lot of research for it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, in the book, there's a mention of this um, 1840 dictionary. Um, called Anthon's Classical Dictionary, 1840. And I think when anyone reads the book, they'll think that I just made it up. But in fact, I didn't. Um, there was a, boy, years and years ago, there was the centennial or bicentennial, I forget what it was, of Hawthorne's birth, Nathaniel Hawthorne's birth. And they, um, Concord asked me to come and be part of an event to celebrate that and um, to celebrate that that big anniversary. And they wanted me to think about um, the books that he wrote for kids, which were a few, um, though they're not so well remembered today. One was called The Wonder Book and the other was called Tanglewood Tales. And there's some other smaller ones as well. In fact, his earliest ones are very, very small ones, literally small. Anyway, um, in, in doing the research for that, um, I came upon the fact that Hawthorne used this dictionary that came out in 1840 um, that would help him understand the myths and get all the details just right. And then, and this was just stupid, dumb luck. I walked into an old bookshop and there it was, this 1841 with his companion, um, which dealt with, not with the mythic stuff, but with the um, ge geographic and such. And they were wicked expensive. And, and I was, um, I just couldn't afford them. They were just too expensive. And then a year or so later, that bookstore decided that they were going, that they were done. They were going to move. They weren't going to be in this town anymore. And so they did a half price sale. And I was there at eight o'clock in the morning on the day that they, uh, that that was going to begin. And the books were still there. So that's, that's how I got them. So I did a lot of reading. Um, sort of feeling like, you know, this is just exactly what Hawthorne did, the same edition of these books. I almost wished that I would find his name in the Senda, like a scrawl that he had done. Like maybe they were really the ones. Um, but I did a lot of that. And this guy is brilliant. He is um, whoever Anthon was. And he could make lots of connections between different ideas. Um, he was super specific, super defined. And so I did a lot of the research just by doing that. And I also went to a book by Edith Hamilton, simply called Mythology, which has got to be the book that all of us know, right? And I had bought that in eighth grade, I still remember, on a field trip to the yep. museum of, you know, one of the museums in um, in New York City. Um, and I still have it up on my desk right now. 
And I, so I read a lot in that um, the dictionary, Anton's dictionary is sort of dull. I mean, the writing is dull, it's just a dictionary. Her writing is terrific. And so I, would, I did a lot in that as well. So those were the two resources that I used for the myths. And then I had to, of course, come up with, well, how would this look today? So if, what's the Hydra, the nine headed Hydra? What would that look like to someone um, living on Cape Cod today? That was the hard and the fun part. Wow. Yeah, so you would have had to imagine <laughs> that. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now, what was your, uh, in all of the books that you've written, what was your favorite research story? This was years ago. Um, when I was growing up in, in New York, most of the um, uh, most of the community around me was the Jewish community. And so the stories of Holocaust were, were beginning to come in a big, big way. Um, you know, we read Anne Frank in school and a lot of the collateral stuff that goes around that. And some of the stories that I heard back then were stories that came out of Holocaust, um, but were not witness stories. So, you know, the Anne Frank story is a witness story, someone who was, was saw it, who lived it. Um, and a lot of stories that came out were people who were writing out of out of the camps and telling what happened in those camps. But the stories that I heard um, that were incredibly vivid were folktale stories that were generated by people who did in fact survive the camps. And they made up stories as a way of just dealing with the horror that they saw. saw. But I'm talking mm -hmm. like a New Yorker that they saw. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that that was the way of handling it. And there's lots of examples. I mean, there was music written during that time in the camps. There were plays that were put on. There's a cookbook, cookbook that was discovered under the floorboards of a railroad station um, from Terezin that um, that the survive that the people heading to Terezin were um, wrote just so that their culture would be remembered through food. Um, so all of that that was later though. But I heard these stories and I thought that's those are amazing. They were and they were they're amazing stories. So I think my favorite research, as it were, was to um, find more, find as many of those stories as I possibly could, um, told by people who had been there. Um, most of them oral still, and there was a very large oral uh, Jewish culture of oral storytelling up in the up and around Ellenville and Napanock and in the Catskill Mountains. Um, so I could go get from from there as well. And I eventually found a little more than 20 stories. Um, some were jokes. There were jokes in about Holocaust. Um, macabre, but funny on some level. And so I put all of those together in a book called Mara Stories. And I'm, you know, if everything else went away, I think I would still be glad about that book if that was the one that that I could that I could still have. Um, I also know that I was young in my career and I could write it so much better now. But you can't do that, right? You you use the skills you've got when you've got the, the opportunity to write the book. So I won't be able to do that. But I was it was a profound experience for me to hear those stories and to find a way to put them in. And Mara, which means bitter. Um, is the teller of the stories. And so the book is called Mara's Stories. She's the narrator for each one of them. And then to do the research from the different camps, um, so it was credible. Um, and also that the characters would be credible. All of that was, that was important to me. So yes, you couldn't do, that. you couldn't do a revision? I mean, a lot of, no, a lot no. of times stories have, you know, books have different like revisions. I don't know. It, I don't know. <laughs> I literally don't know if I could do something like that. Maybe I could ask the publisher about that. I, it feels to me like it's, it was done and then they, you know, it was contracted with them and such. It was also interesting because at the end of it, um, there's, there are issues for tellers, obviously, about, about folk tales. And I'm Schmidt, you know, this is a German name. And so is it okay for a guy named Schmidt to write these stories about Holocaust? And so there was, uh, 
I really struggled with that. The whole thing was done. And I got to this crisis of, oh my gosh, you know, should I just hand all this over to someone else? Should I, what should I do? So I wrote to, no kidding, Elie Wiesel. Um, and I said, you know, here's what I've done. Here's the manuscript. Could you just give me some advice about, would you be willing to give me some advice about whether it's so inappropriate for me to do this? Or if you think it is, what I could do with this? And he wrote back this beautiful, beautiful letter, which of course I have kept. Um, yeah. That said, this is an act of social justice. You must go ahead and publish this. And that's what I did. And I don't know if the book has ever been critiqued. No one has ever said anything to me about, you know, you were the wrong guy to do it. Um, but I think I would say, you know, okay, I, I did what I did and it feels good. It feels like it was the right thing. I think now would be a really good time to redo it. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Maybe so. laughs> Yeah, it, it it was an important, it was important for me certainly to do this. It felt to me to do it. And it's plus, I mean, Holocaust survivors, I mean, it's a long time now. There's not many around anymore. And I had seen no one getting these stories down. And since most of, most of them are unpublished in any form, and yeah. I hate the notion that they could just, forgot, they would just pass away because no one ever recorded them. Um, so this is sort of my contribution to say, yeah, this, let's get these down. Please try and get it redone or republished or something, because it's, 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 I mean, right now, it is the time to do it. Absolutely. Oh my God. I know, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay, anyway, getting back to your, your children's book. <laughs> um, <laughs> What was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and, and putting out the, um, you know, the uh, labors of, of Hercules Beale? The, um, to go from mythical labors, you know, like fight this harpy or whatever, or, or find the mares that, that, of Diomedes that, are, that eat people, you know, all sorts of things. Um, to find a way to, to make them feel like they are contemporary, that you're dealing with something contemporary was one of the big ones. Um, and to make it clear that, that you could, so that the, that the reader can say, oh yeah, here are the clear connections between the mythical thing and the real thing that this kid is facing. So at one point he's remembering, for example, um, I mean, the Hydra, right? So there's nine, this nine headed monster and he goes to, uh, um, he remembers going in to see his father, who after the accident has survived for just a brief time. And he is hooked up to um, one of those stands with all the different things that come out of it, all the monitors and all of that sort of stuff. And there are nine of them. And um, in, the, in the myth, there's one that's immortal. There's one of those, the heads that can't be cut off or it just keeps going right back or something, but it's, it can't be killed. Um, so how to make, make that work? And it felt to me like, all right, I can create this moment here when this kid walks in and sees his father dying, essentially. And this monstrous thing, which he's attached to. And at the end, once his father does pass, how he doesn't want the last monitor to be turned off because that's the end. That would be the last one. And so as all of them are turned off one by one by one by one, he finally tells the nurse there, not that one, just don't. And she understands immediately what's going on with him because that's that's the end, right? I mean, that's, that's over. Um, and so that's that was the hardship of that, to make sure that those work in a real way. And the other way is that uh, the other difficulty of it is that a lot of them are alike. <laughs> I mean, he, he kills a lion, brings that back. He kills this horse or whatever, brings that back. He kills this and brings that back. He kills these terrible birds. brings those. And so after a while, it just feels like kill an animal, show the king, da, da, da. And so it, in a book, you have to find ways to make sure that those feel different each time, that it's a new thing, and that the reader isn't going to say, oh, yeah dead animal who's going to take care of it would do the same thing. Um, and sometimes he refuses to kill it. 
so um there's with the horses um it's the horses of diomedes um which do terrible things and he gets them brings them back to show the king to prove that he's done the task and then instead of just killing them which is what he tends to do he releases them um because he can't bear to do it even though these horses have killed his best friend one of his servants he can't bear to take vengeance on the horses themselves they are what they are now because the myths are what they are too he releases them on Mount Olympus. They get too close to the gods and the gods kill them. Um, but he doesn't. And so I came upon one of, um, instead of that, he finds coyotes. Um, and these coyotes are terrorizing the, uh, not Cape Cod, but terrorizing like pets, like a dog or a cat, which could be hurt by, coyote, um, by coyotes. Now, while this, while I was writing, in fact, that's exactly what happened to us. We had, a whole bunch of um, feral cats that lived out in the barn. They took care of mice and all those sorts of things. But then a pack of coyotes moved into the south field over here. And every night I would hear a scream. And one by one, all the cats left. We don't have any cats anymore. And then the coyotes move on. That's what they do. They move not work like that. Even in, here in Michigan, in rural Michigan. So the um, caches, coyotes that um, that are killing off um, the other animals. And the guy, next, the neighbor next door, hands him the rifle. You no, know, he says, they're just rodents. They're just big rodents. You just get, you'd kill them like you would kill a mouse in your house. But he can't bear it. And so like, like Hercules, um, he instead doesn't, doesn't kill the coyotes. He calls a, an animal um, uh, sort of shelter and they bring them up north. So in the end, it's the same as the myth. An animal that kills other animals, he catches it. He has the opportunity to kill it. He doesn't. He finds a way to get it up to northern northern Maine, actually. And they're released. So I don't kill them off at all. But it felt, felt like I had to constantly find ways to match them up that were, that were clear. Um, but also then to change them so that they are interesting enough. You hope they're interesting. Well, that was oh. a long answer. I'm sorry. That went on. No, that's I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Wow. That that is a big challenge. <laughs> that was the challenge. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so what can we expect from you in the near future? Uh, in a couple of months, there is a uh, book that Leah Henderson and I put together, edited together called A Little Bit Super, and it's 13 middle grade stories. Um, each one is about a kiddo who has a superpower that's incredibly minor. You know, it's not like Thor, right? It's not like Superman right? or any sort of Marvel character. Um, it's a character, like one of the stories by Linda Sue Park is about a kiddo who can discern whether or not avocados are ripe, which apparently is a really hard thing to do. Um, another one is about a kiddo who is a uh, who's really good at matching relationship, like a Yentek kind of figure. And she's really, really, really good at that sort of thing. Um, another one is the character who can um, hear animals speak, but only one afternoon a month. Um, so things like that. So those stories are, um, that's all done. That'll be out, I think, in March or April. And then later in the year, a book called um, Jupiter Rising, which is a sequel to an earlier book called Orbiting Jupiter. Um, and that'll be, yeah, that'll be out, I don't know, like late, late um, summer, early fall, something along those lines. So those are the next two that come. And then the last, the next one is a book with Ron Kirchie. Um, I really started to enjoy doing collaborative work. And Ron is a great, great writer. Um, he used to write for television, Hill Street Blues. Remember Hill Street Blues? Yeah. On um, that TV show. He was one of the writers for that show. So uh, we worked together on this, which I thought was going to be hard and turned out to be an amazing delight. And those are 40, 40 stories, actually 30 stories that we um, both worked on together um, about a group of kids on a beach in New Jersey. No kidding, in New Jersey Beach. Um, each one is a really fast story, like four or five pages, just really kind of a blast of a story. 
and it focuses on all these different kids who are having different experiences on the beach on this one day um, in a New Jersey beach. So that's done as well. So those are the next three. Great. Thank you. Okay, now I have some questions for you about being a writer. What's your sure. favorite part about being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? Um, probably the hardest part, which is the beginning. When you first get that idea and it feels like, oh, I wonder if, and you, you sit at your desk and um, I work at a typewriter, not a computer. And so I'm, I mess around on that for a while. And then you go, okay, this sounds right. The voice is right. And it's interesting. So I'm thinking about it late at night, which is always a, a good clue, right? If you can't stop thinking about it when you're walking your dog or if you're late at night or, you know, if you're watching the wood stove or whatever, it's, um, that's a really good clue that this is going to go. So I love those early days when you're thinking this could really work. And you, it's, it goes well. Um, and that's sort of where I am on the next book, this book about this Western Massachusetts town. So I, I love that time. Um, the stuff, you know, once it's accepted and you have all the copy editing and such, that also was really good work. Um, it's different. It's a different sort of feel. Um, I have been blessed with the best editors. I mean, oh my gosh, I've just been really, really blessed with amazing editors um, with, and we've become friends um, and we trust each other and we trust each other's instincts. And, you know, they've been incredibly kind to me and to my whole family. Um, I have published with Houghton Mifflin and now I'm with Harper Collins because Harper Collins purchased Houghton Mifflin's trade um, work. And unlike so many writers, I, I've stayed with the same publisher for like, 30 years it's uh it's just been a great relationship but that is a little less interesting to me or at least at least a little less pleasurable than the early days when everything is who knows what happens next oh my gosh suppose this happened and you know all of that i love those days great yeah. so what's been your favorite adventure during your writing career huh um I'm not a guy that tends to travel much. I kind of like, I mean, I live in a 200 year old house. Um, I love where I live. I love the land around us. I love that I see deer every day. Um, I, I even love that we're sort of snowed in and I can crank up the wood stove here and we have enough food and take the border collie out. I mean, it's, I love that. So when I do travel to a place that's particularly exotic, that's, it's really fun for me. Um, so last September and then this coming September, I'll be up at a writing workshop in Alaska in a small, small island of the Aleutians on the south side of Alaska. We're the only ones there. Um, and it's unbelievable. I mean, I, you're in a little float plane, driving, or driving, flying by a mountain just to get there. You land on the water. Um, you're flying so close to the mountain that if if someone on the on the land like threw a tennis ball, they would hit you. I mean, it was that close. Um, and then a great group of people, 30 people that you work with really hard. And in the afternoon, you go out and you watch the whales or the sea lions. I mean, it's that's been amazing. I think that and then um, not long ago, I was in Belgium, in Brussels and in Paris one for a translation and one for the, a new book coming. And, you know, again, for me, I don't travel that much. So to even take a seven hour flight is a long deal, a big deal for me. And to land in Paris and to see the Arc de Triomphe, you know, to, to climb up the hills up to the cathedrals, um, to speak my high school French, which was a riot. Um, or to sit, I was with one of my kids, to sit in the Grand Place of, of Brussels and to drink you know, these fruity beers in an afternoon and to sit with my uh, son who's so busy all the time, but we could just sit there for like hours and just talk. Those, were, those have been really cool trips. Um, 
and they were all, you know, there was work to do for them. And that was good. And editors to meet and issues of translation to, to go through, um, talk about the next book. Um, there's a translation coming out in a couple of weeks. So talking about that, talking about a graphic novel um, version of one of the books that comes out in February. Um, this was fantastic. So I guess I would say some of that, the, the opportunity to travel to go to what are to me anyway, really exotic places, someone who doesn't travel, those have been pretty exciting to do. Mm -hmm. Especially, I have to say, especially Alaska. You know, I stayed on Eastern time, which is what Michigan is. is. Um, and so I was four hours ahead of everyone else. But what that meant is I would get up, you know, what was to me like, you know, 6.30 or so, but was like two in the morning there. But that's when I would get up and they told us, don't go outside. There's bears on the island. Don't go outside in the night. But, I mean, you couldn't believe it. You couldn't believe it. I did go out. Of course I went outside. And you go see these stars, these constellations I'd never seen before. And they were, it was just spectacular. And way off in the bay, these boats that are riding at anchor, these fishing boats with their lights, you hear the sound of the whales. You hear it. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing. The number of stars you can see when you're that far away from light was, I mean, I, I just had never understood it. I, you know, we live pretty far out of town. And you see a lot of stars, but there's nothing compared to what you see in Alaska. Anyway, so stuff like that. Wow. That's great. It so great. what is the greatest lesson you've learned thus far in your writing career? Hmm. Pay attention, to pay attention to things. Um, as, a, as a writer, of course, you're always looking for new material. Um, but I think it's really important just to pay attention, particularly to a middle school kid, the way that person talks, but the way that all person expresses himself or herself um, and understands the way of the world and expresses interest in the world. I know that I will never be able to stay up with, um, with the technology changes. <laughs> I just can't. I, I just know that. I mean, like I said, I use a typewriter. Um, but there are universals about how human beings respond to stress and tension or excitement that I think you need to pay attention to. And I think as a writer, and maybe just as a human being, I've learned to do that. Um, more and more kid who comes in sits on a bleacher and he is watching this happen it's, it's in a gym which is a hard place to give a conversation or to uh, give a school visit to 408th graders are filing in 408th graders at a gym and this young one guy sits on the front row of the bleachers by himself and these three girls come and they sit next to him and they're not paying attention to him and they're not being mean or anything. They're just sitting there. They're doing their own thing. And this one guy is sitting here next to them. And then if you can imagine, the very worst thing that could possibly happen happens. A bunch of guys come and sit down on this other side. And they know the girls, and the girls know them. And so they're going back and forth, talking and talking. And they're not being bad, right? They're not being mean. But they're ignoring this kid, this one in the middle. And he has no idea what to do. And I'm sitting there thinking, get up, move to a different place, push him away. Because they start to lean over and they start to take his space. As, and they're just trying to be talking to each other. By the time I was ready to start, I kid you not, this kid was almost invisible. They had sort of closed in around him. And he had gone back, he had pushed back on a bleacher. So what happened with him? Like what? What has gone on in his life that he can't say, wait a minute here, why doesn't he get up? Why doesn't he um, sort of assert? And why does he let himself be erased? And those, those sorts of things, I think I really, really want to pay attention to. You know, um, what are the small indications or large that say, this is going on in my life and I can't articulate them but this is what's going on. 
So maybe that, you know, I think being a writer helps you um, to do that. I mean, it's not to be political, but maybe to be political. Why is it so hard to just to look at someone else who disagrees with you and to under, try and understand, why do you believe this? Why is that so hard? Instead of vilifying that person and saying, you believe this? I hate your guts. Why is that such a hard thing? Because that's where we are. And that's a scary place for a culture to be or a community to be. So yeah, pay, I would say that. Maybe I've, a lesson is pay attention. Don't be a jerk. Don't overwhelm. Just pay attention. Okay. So what piece of advice would you, would you want to share with other writers aside from pay attention? <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're a young writer, um, this is the advice that Avi always gives. And I think Avi is really, really smart with this. Um, he says, if you want to be a writer, if you're a young writer and you're just starting out, you're in middle school, high school, even college, he says the most important thing that you have to do is read, 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 read. And then he will say it for like six times. You want read. And you always read. And he's really, really good about this. And he's right. I mean, I've taught creative writing for 30 years. And I can tell pretty much at the first paragraph if you've been a reader. Um, if you've gone into Annie's bookshop and if you've gotten a whole bunch of books and you sat down over a summer and said, I'm going to read great writing, I can I can always tell right away. Um, if you haven't, then it's always going to be clunky. It's always going to feel unnatural. But I can tell right away, first paragraph, if you've been a, a reader. Um, and I think that's probably the most important advice any young writer can take to heart. If you're going to write huge numbers of, of uh, you know, those, you know, those huge fantasy books that are 10,000 pages long, um, I hope you've read some before so that you can get a sense of how those huge things can be structured. And I, I would also tell um, tell writers, write what's in your own heart. Um, so many people, so many writers who are just starting, um, maybe particularly in my field, um, are so worried about publication and are so worried about earning a living through the writing that they tend not to do what's truly in their own heart, but they tend towards those things which they think are going to be popular. How many vampire books came out when Twilight was at its height? And you just want to say, guys, okay, she did what she did. That's great. That's what she wanted to do. That was her idea. Fine. Do your own. Do your own thing. And, you know, if you've read, if you've read Thoreau, if you've read Walden, I mean, that's his whole message. Do your own thing. Don't, you know, don't build a cabin on Walden. I already did that. Do your own thing. And I think um, those writers who are tempted to do to write books that are that are going to because something is popular or something is hip right now or this has a likelihood of getting published because so and so has already gotten a whole series of these um that isn't you that's not who you really are so find that thing that you that you want to learn about um and maybe this is the last thing of the of three here um maybe you heard too that advice you know write what you know um and it's well-meant advice. I get it. You know, you want to get the details right. I, I, I get all of that. But in the end, you already know it. I mean, you're giving a report. You don't write what you what you know. You write what you want to know. That will give you the book. I want to know about this kid who's experienced loss in Hercules. How does he recover? And here's this teacher who's so hard-nosed, it seems, um, how does he help him in that situation? And I think every book I've ever done, I hope this is true. Every book I've ever done is me trying to figure out how does this work or what's going to happen with this um, or in this world, what's a likely way that this thing is going to play out um, or whatever. You know, write what you want to know and then you're writing. You know, everything else is a report, um, but write what you want to know. Sounds great. Um, are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you would recommend to other writers that may have helped you in your career? I have been, for the most part, kind of a solitary writer, and perhaps that's not a great thing. Um, but I am working right now with a number of um, 
writing workshops, annual workshops and such. The one that I work with right now that I think is stunning, amazing, incredible is called Well Rock. Um, Patty Lee Gouch is an editor. Um, she did things like Al Moon and she edits Patricia Polacco. And I mean, really the, the great ones, right? David Small, I think has worked with her. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, really, really um, a fabulous editor. And she and I and others um, do a couple of a virtual and then also an in-person one in Lexington, Michigan. Um, and the thing is run by Sherry Becker, who's also a novelist. And it's a mentorship um, program. I think it's, um, I wish I had done it when I was 32 years old. <laughs> uh, so well rock. And it's, uh, it's a great mentorship. And there's, of course, many um, like that that are around. Um, where you have the opportunity to work for a week or more, and then maybe a semester. Well Rock goes over a course of a semester. It's not an academic program, but it's working with people for about 160 pages of, of a novel. Um, so that one, or others, um, where you can really intensely work on something um, with someone who, who is smart and a good editor and got a good eye, and someone who doesn't love you right? Someone who doesn't love you that's going to say, this is wonderful. I'm going to put this on my refrigerator. Someone who's got a cold eye and is just going to look at the text and say, nope, nope, no, this rots. I mean, whatever, or this is good. But someone who doesn't sort of love you and is just going to praise you, I think finding those groups can be incredibly useful. So I would say something along those lines. Okay. Sounds great. So now question about you as a person. What is one uh, thing? What is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Um, wow. Uh, I don't know. I have some quirky interests that I are that are fun for me, but probably not fun for anyone else. Um, so I I really 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 enjoy um, collecting certain kinds of books, and ones that are hard to find and ones that are not too pricey to find. Um, and I, I think that can be really a pleasure. Um, and maybe it gets me into a whole lot of bookshops, which I really love to do. So I don't know if you can see this behind me. I really can't. That grouping of books right underneath the, the Rembrandt painting there. Yep. Those are all, all um, fifth, 16th and 17th century books. Um, Spencer, Sydney. Sir Thomas Brown. There's a couple of first editions of John Donne. I mean, those sorts of books, I love finding those um, where people may not may not recognize that these are important, but they're important to me somehow. And since I taught early British literature, it is wicked cool to bring in, when you're teaching John Donne, to bring in, here's a first edition of John Donne, just hold it. Just feel like this is what it was like when it came out in 1640. Or Sir Thomas Brown, isn't this an amazing essay? Here's the first day it was published, first, first binding in which it was published. Um, I love to do sort of stuff like that. And then I also collect the, the New England writers. So around the corner there, there's um, early Hawthorne and first of Whittier and Longfellow and Alcott and um, Margaret Fuller. I'm probably missing some. Um, I, Thoreau, um, they're just really fun. And it's fun to find for me ones where you're not um, you're not stunned by a ten thousand dollar price tag, right? And the ones that you can just find. So I love to do stuff like that. Um, I think not so many people know that I'm a real big dog person. Um, there are times I think I could just do only that and be happy, like running a large kennel or a no kill shelter or something like that. That that day might come. I mean, wouldn't that be a cool thing, a cool job to have a no-kill shelter, a dog, which is trouble, and I'll take the dog, I'll try and get it adopted, but I will never allow it to, to be killed. I mean, that feels to me like it'd be a good thing to do in the world. Um, so oh, I love yeah. that stuff. So maybe those two things, I guess. Okay, those are great. That's wonderful. That yeah. Fun to have a shelter out back and you go out and there's, I don't know, couple of dozen three dozen maybe dogs that are not don't have a home and they you know that these animals are going to be with you for as long as it takes Bye. 
That's wonderful. Yeah, what a what a wonderful thought. Dogs are wonderful. <laughs> they really are. Okay. Now, what? Well, I, you just kind of answered the question. What is or are your passions when you're not writing? So you you just kind uh, of answered dogs. that. Dogs. Um, gardening. I'm not good at it, but I like to do it. Um, we have a lot of deer here, and it's I like that. Um, I don't particularly like fences. And so if you are a gardener and you don't like fences and you have a lot of deer, that's a really <laughs> terrible combination. It's really, really bad. So we don't get much, <laughs> we don't get much uh, from the garden, but there's a, uh, I don't know. I like to do it anyway. There's a scene, you remember Robert Lawson, that, that children's writer, um, Rabbit Hill he did was his big one. And then a sequel, I can't remember the name of the sequel, but there's a scene where he has a uh, this couple that they they plant this huge garden, and, <laughs> and um, all the animals are watching. So you're looking from the point of view of the animals, and they're watching this garden come to fruition. And they have a statue of Saint Francis in the middle, and on the night when all the animals have conspired that they're going to just ravage this garden, they're going to take everything, right? And you're thinking this is going to be a really horrible moment for these, this couple. The couple takes off this cover that they've had on the St. Francis statue and it's written underneath, there is enough for all. And so the animals see this and they realize that the garden has been planted for them and for the family. And so they do go that night, but they only take enough and they leave enough for the family. Aww. And at the end of the book, I read that and I go, what a bunch of hooey. That's not what they're going to do. They're going to eat everything. They're not going to leave it. That's crazy. And I said, no, this guy has never planted a garden. And I don't know if he ever did. But but there's no way that you could write that and not be laughing your head off if you've really been a gardener. So, so uh, yeah. <laughs> wishful uh, thinking. Wishful thinking. In the, yeah. But I like to do it. I like to um, garden here. And I like to mess around the house. Like I said, it's an old, old house that constantly needs help. Um, and that's fun, too. So what does your writing space look like? Um, if you had asked that like two years ago, I would have looked across the window there and about well, 300 yards away or so, there's a uh, small house, a small shed. And I wrote there for many years. I have six children. And so it was sort of important to have a space that was just writing. Um, and my wife had this, this white door behind me. It's my wife's study. Um, she had that space. So she would work there and I would work there. And it was, I mean, it was filled with books and a desk and a chair, and, which is all you need, right? I mean, it's, that's all you really, really need. And that was great. I like that. Um, today that squirrels got into that and they were horrible. I hate squirrels. I, I mean, horrible. So at first I was like, okay, we can just repair this. And we did. And then I thought, ah, oh, I don't really need to go away there. So now I'm in directly above us. There's one of the oldest rooms in the, um, in the house. And what's nice about that space is that there is an adjacent room that goes over the porch that no one has been in. There's no way to get into that room unless you go into the attic over the old 1830s roof and climb down head first. No one has ever done that, that I know of. So there's a room in our house that no one has been in. And I just love, I love that, right? That somehow there's a mystery there. And when people say, well, why did you like find a way in? And you know, I don't know, cut a hole in it. I kind of like the mystery, you know? I just kind of like it. So there's a desk there and a whole lot of books and a chair and a couch, um, space for the dog to lie down. It's small. It's a really small space, but that's, that's it. Um, and like I said, there's a, it's an old desk and it's a, um, an old typewriter, 1953 Royal typewriter. And there's a few things around that I really have had since I was a kid, um, some wood from old iron sides. When I was 10 wow. years old, there was a renovation. <clears throat> and I was looking down into the hole that's down into the ancient part of old Ironsides, that ship. 
And this guy who was like, one of the workers said, you want to go down? And I go, yeah, of course you want to go down. And so he took me by the arm and he lowered me down to some workmen who were down below the decks. And it was amazing to see it in the smell of the tar. Um, and then afterwards they said, you want some of the wood, some of the original wood? And I go, yeah. So I still have that still upstairs. Amazing. Um, some wood from um, some trees that Thoreau planted. There's a row of, of pines that went up past where his cabin were. Those are completely gone now. But back in the early 80s, there were still the remnants of some of those. And I took just a tiny piece of wood from that. Um, a pine cone from a tree that Emily Dickinson planted. I mean, stuff like that, which just pleased me to have, right? Um, yeah, so that's it. But it is a small space. Okay. <laughs> now, it, that's the room that you have to go in face first? <laughs> no, that's right next door. Right next to it. Okay. Right. Yeah, so there's no way into that room. So I've never been in there, into that other oh, room. Okay. Um, and, and there's clearly was once a window, you can see it from the outside, but that has been boarded over. Who knows when? I don't know. Um, so there's just no way to get into that place anymore. I like that. It's <laughs> weird. It is weird. Okay. It's really lovely. So, so when when you're writing, um, do you prefer uh, music or silence? Um, and if music, what kind of music? Yeah, I'm sort of boring on this total silence. I I don't have anything. You know, I I've tried that. Um, Maurice Sendak used to play Mozart. He always played Mozart while he was drawing and writing, and it just distracts me. Um, I kind of admire. And I'm jealous of people who go to coffee shops, you know, and can just open their computer and start to write. Um, but I just can't, I just can't do that. So I have to have silence. If there's a dog in there, fine. Um, but that's really it. Hey, um, and do you, um, do you need to have any kind of food or drink when you're writing? Tea. 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 Um, yeah, I really like to have some tea there. I don't I don't drink coffee. I've never liked it. Um, so there's a scene in Hercules, by the way, where they make fun of co co coffee in New York. Coffee, coffee drinkers. Yeah. Um, and I just never liked it that much. But I do like to drink um, good tea. Um, so that okay. is probably the only thing I can do. Okay. Um, and you've already mentioned that you have a border collie. Um, and so does, does, what's your border collie's name? Bingley. So, Bing. um, in Pride and Prejudice, we had a Darcy from Pride and Prejudice years uh, ago. Yes. So Bingley is Darcy's best friend in Pride and Prejudice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, does Bingley help you or hinder you with your work? Well, he does not help. Um, he likes to go outside sometimes on the hour. Um, and sometimes on the hour and a half. And what that means is that he, like, he will just not let you alone. He'll just jump up. Um, he will do his whining. We'll just look at you. We'll bark a little bit. He'll do all the things that dogs do to make you feel guilty. Um, and, and eventually I'll get up and we'll go out. Um, I mean, border collies have to have, ideally, you have to have five times a day 45 minutes just with them, just focused time. Now I had six kids, so that was easy for us, right? Cause you could take turns doing that. But that was a while ago. <laughs> and now there's two of us living in the house, my uh, son and me, and we have, um, that's it. And so when Bingley wants to go out, it means again, 45 minutes and you're away from your job or you're away from the writing. So he does not help with this at all, but you know, it's worth it. Right to have a good dog, that's fine. Okay, and I just have two more questions for you. One is, where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And I always plug Annie's, um, so you you can get Gary's books at Annie's if you call us at five zero eight seven nine six five six one three, or you can write you can write us uh, or email us at, <clears throat> at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can people find your books? Um, I, I guess 
at any any reputable bookshop. Um, and I think that's just about the easiest way. Is uh, yeah, I guess that would be the easy way. I I wish I could say that I have this exotic and wonderful website, but I don't, and I don't do social media at all. Um, I think there's a Facebook page, but it's not from me, and I have nothing to do with it. I've never been on it, so I'm. I know, boy, this sounds so unbelievable in this day and age, but I really don't do, um, I'm just not good at the technology. And I wish I could say I'm doing it out of some high-minded purpose, and maybe I am, but I think it's just because I'm dumb at it. I'm just not very good. I mean, what we're doing right now, this is like the height of my technological abilities, right? I mean, we did this Zoom, and I actually pressed a few buttons and you appeared. And it was so amazing. I'm always a little bit surprised. But, you know, other than that, like when people say, can you do a reading and you it's like you pull up your screen, something from that, you're gonna, I don't know how to do that. And I just I so I don't I don't have any exotic social um, social media. And that's stuff. why you use a typewriter instead of a computer. <laughs> I use the typewriter. It slows me down, which I want. And I like the sound of it. And you know what? You get to the end of your line. And remember what a typewriter does? It goes ding. It just goes, good job. Ding, do it again. And then you do another line and it goes, ding. And it goes, good job, do it again. I love typewriters. <laughs> but yeah. And you, so you answered my last question anyways, which was how can people, uh, you know, find, uh, how can we follow your work and, and share your awesomeness? But uh... yeah, HarperCollins has, I think something out a page or so, but I don't have any web page that I actually authentically look at or um or work at at all um yeah <laughs> okay well that, that so answers funny. that <laughs> yeah. okay um so so that's that's basically it um and i know that um you have been on the the mock um newbury awards list um for for the uh labors of uh, excuse me for the uh, labors of of Hercules Beetle, um, which means you're kind of in the in the running for the for the Newbery Awards. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll see how that comes out. I guess that's on January twenty first. So we we will see, and good luck with that. Okay, thanks, thanks so much. And we will uh, ho hopefully be hearing from you again. And right. if you do if you do get to Worcester, we would love to have you. I would love to see the star and, and to, to meet you in, in person. That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Gary Schmidt. Thank you.